praise God, I pass the time to call in. No. Thank you, Pastor. So um, for questions and answer, you can post in the chat now, or if you like, you can unmute yourself to speak directly. So let's uh, start it rolling. Good morning, Pastor. Bless you. Um, my question is, um, I've always wondered how, why Moses was did not pick up that God wanted him to raise the rod. And uh, my question to you is, is it that he was in discerning? Had God told him as part of previous instructions and he forgot? And how do we um, uh, ensure that when the presence of God is available, mm -hmm. we are either discerning or walking in mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. instructions to know what to do mm -hmm. to utilize it. Thank you. A very good question. Thank you. Moses is like us. He's human. He's also learning how to do signs and wonders. Just like all of us were to learn how to do signs and wonders and how to transport ourselves in this end times. And remember the first time that Moses responded when Pharaoh rejected him? He complained. He said, God, why are you sending me? Why is this happening? And uh, uh, he can't take it. And so he's human. And after God counseled him, and, and he learned the presence of God. He also was learning the methodology of God. And after his first encounter, these were his statements. And he says, uh, Why do you trouble these people? They say in Exodus 5.22. Why is it you sent me? Since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to your people. Neither have I delivered your people at all. In other words, blaming God and saying, God, they are not delivered. Moses, like Elijah, is human. He expected instant. He didn't expect that it would be ten times rejection. So, he was also learning the methodology of God. And when he came out from Egypt, seeing the cloud above him, the fire by night, he was still learning that there is power in him lifting the rod. After that incident, in Exodus, parting the Red Sea, he knew he could exercise that methodology. Just like, how many times must God tell us that when we lay hands on the sick, they shall be healed? So most of us automatically would be able to uh, lay hands on the sick. But of course, some people lay hands on the sick without the presence of God. And it is different. But when God is present, sometimes He wants us to stretch our hands and lay hands on the sick. Especially when the anointing is less and weaker, like Jesus in His hometown. When it's greater, you don't even need to lay hands. So Moses was learning that methodology. That's why by chapter 17, you don't see the Word of God. But somehow he knew that raising the rod is releasing something. And without any uh, command from God that is written, what may have actually spoken to him, he did it. And he saw the power of God. And later on, when they build 
the things of God in the wilderness and uh, different vessels and senses. Under God's command, he knew that once a year in the Day of Atonement, they will put the incense of God in the censer and the presence of God will be there and under the covering, they can enter the Holy of Holies. So when the plague started in Israel, without instruction by God, he told Aaron, take the censer and run between the people and, and, and the judgment. Oh, it's a frightening thing when God was, was, was killing people. And you had to stand in the presence of God. Moses knew that God will respect his own presence. And so he told Aaron, run, run, and then I got to run and take the censer and, and, and come between God and the people. And that censer, because present, stop. So, the reason and the answer to your question, why didn't Moses knew that? Because he was human and he was still learning the presence of God, which all of us will probably go through. Thank you for the question. Amen. <laughs> there is a question here. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for the message. Do you think God will use crystals as a vessel to heal people or would you say this is only a new age principle? Is it new age thing that turn the attention of people away from God into some belief system that is not in the Bible. And that is why Jesus didn't leave behind a picture or a piece of wood that he touched or a picture. Uh, I, 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 if if they taken a photo or portrait of Jesus, today people will use that as idolatry. The way they use the, the brazen serpent that healed people in those days it became an idol. People worship it. God will not replace himself with a piece of crystal, piece of wood, piece of cloth, or a picture, even if it's a cross, because it's idolatry. We must learn that God is spirit and thou shalt not make any other gods or wooden image or graven image to replace God. So there's a reason. Because people will start worshipping crystals. And people will start evaluating which crystal has more power, the other has less power, and the nonsense that come. And so <clears throat> God will not use a crystal to heal people. He is inert, useless, nothing to do with God's power. <clears throat> you can appreciate its beauty, but that's all. Next question. The presence of God can't stand sin. Therefore, we must live holy life. Do we have to constantly ask for mercy and forgiveness so we can... We don't, so we don't ever without even knowing. Um, <clears throat> it is enough if we believe in the blood of Jesus. And every time we extol the blood of Jesus or the name of Jesus, God knows that we're under his covering. And the only reason God tolerates us is we are under his blood. And under Jesus' blood, you never have the presence of God manifesting and God's and, and like the angels say, take off your shoes or sandals. Because Jesus' presence is greater than the manifest presence in the old covenant. And we are blessed, we are fortunate that Jesus' presence is so powerful. And of course. We do need to have a humble approach. We need, do need to acknowledge the way Daniel acknowledged 
his own sin before he prayed for the sins of Israel. We do need to acknowledge that the blood of Jesus has cleansed all our sin constantly, and that's enough. So that's how we do it, using the blood of Jesus and extolling the benefits of the blood of Jesus and how it makes us holy as Jesus himself. Amen. Next question. Does God choose vessels to use in order to release his presence amongst believers? Well, firstly, from the Bible, what do you think? The answer is obviously yes. From Genesis to Revelation, we see God choose his vessels sometime before they were born. <clears throat> and what happens if we live with a vessel God chose in the same generation? We work with a vessel. And David tried his best to work with Saul. And even when Saul went apart and away from God, David still respected his position. So God does choose vessels. And our choice in gener every generation and every country is to learn to work with those vessels God has chosen. <laughs> Hello, Pastor. Hi, Frank. Go ahead. I'm doing great, Pastor. Uh, so, uh, Pastor Slightly Diagnist, louder. Tune yourself louder. Thank you. Okay. So, Pastor, there are these stories in the Gospels about Jesus, where, uh, especially on the first one, where he said that uh, when he read Isaiah 60, and then he said that the scripture was fulfilled in their hearing, and uh, when he discussed with them, and they were angry, and then they tried, they drove, they drove, they drove him near the pitch uh, of the mountain, and they wanted to throw him down. But the Bible said that he passed in their midst and walk, and walk away. That there's another story as well, where they said that they wanted to stone him, but the Bible said that he hit himself and walked in the midst and went by. So that's, this story are also examples of how the presence of God can suppress state of beings. That maybe can be happening in people of ang anger or different manifestation of evil, or how we can just God can change the state of being of people without them realizing. So, but my question was more like: could it be that if Jesus, if God has increased too much of his presence in Jesus Christ while he was ministering to them? Could it be that they will just fall on, under, under his power and not start worshiping him? Because sometimes there is this thing about when you worship God, you just want, when you are aware of him, you just want like, to love him to do all what he wants. But when you encounter, when you go now out something out of it, and you encounter different things in life, now you, you start feeling different thoughts and different actions and so on and so forth. So my question was like, could it be that if God has increased too, too much, maybe, of his presence in Christ, could the, the Jews who were listening to him, even the Pharisees, could they still have those thoughts of trying to betray Jesus and doing all of what they were doing? Thank you for the interesting question. And so to paraphrase your question again, uh, you spoke about incident where they were going to throw Jesus down a cliff and then suddenly just turn around and walk through them. Uh, was it the presence of God protecting him? Definitely, yes. And you talk about another incident where they want to stone him and he just walked away in their midst. They couldn't stone him, couldn't throw a single stone. And yes, that was the presence of God. However, in your question, there was an assumption that the presence of God would would cause a person to bow down and worship him. Unfortunately, 
not always. Because uh, a person in darkness, a person in sin, when the presence of God is there, like you saw clearly, King Saul was living in sin. In the presence of God under Samuel, he was naked. Though he was still prophesying, he was rolling on the ground like a madman. So the presence of God does not affect every person the same way. To those who love him, presence of God will cause a person to bow down. But remember the demoniac, the person possessed by a legion of demons? He scream, he shout, he became super strong, could break chains. He rushed to Jesus. When he saw Jesus, then he bowed down. So, uh, for some reason, that man who had been so oppressed had a short window of awareness of how great God is. And he bowed down. And Jesus delivered him, although he was still demonized. And of course, we know that demons will bow down when they see Jesus. And they're afraid of Jesus. And they always say, why well, you come before your time? Because they expect to be judged. And when Jesus first coming, they thought it was his second coming judgment, but it was not time yet. So uh, everyone reacts differently in God's presence. Sometimes I felt seen God's presence. I can see some people still chatter and talk like God's presence was not there. There's no respect for God's presence. And sometimes when God is doing something very holy, and then some people will do the most ridiculous things. Or sometimes in a worship, we could sense God's presence. And then a drummer or musician was not sensitive, could disrupt that beautiful presence. So not everyone has the same sensitivity. It would have been great if the presence of God caused everyone to bow down and worship. But only those who truly love Him will bow down and worship. A lot of people ignorant God's presence. And Satan himself has to be forced on his knees, literally, and uh, before he will acknowledge God. Uh, there's a story in William Braham's ministry how a demonized person was challenging him in a miracle service. And he was screaming and shouting and he rushed against him very violently. But he could not go near. He's like an invisible shield around William Braham. And then while he was screaming and shouting, William Braham spoke very softly only those who were near could hear. And he said, you shall bow down in the presence of the man of God. And the person was demonized. You could feel he was resisting the pressure. There must be angels and demons forcing him down. And in the end, he was forced down on his knees. And uh, the story didn't say what happened to the demonized man, but I will assume that the demon will be cast out and then the man will be saved. But the presence of God, Satan has a different reaction. Demons have a different reaction. And different humans have a different reaction to the presence of God. Some of them actually got more angry the story is in the book of Acts, chapter 7, uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7, where Stephen was stoned. You can see that the, they, they shut their ears as they run against him and they stone him. So the presence of God on Stephen did not have the same effect on those who are under the power of darkness. They literally shut their ears. Because they just couldn't stand the words that were coming out of his mouth. A totally different reaction. Remember, they saw he looked like an angel before him. And they couldn't stand his preaching anymore. And 
you see these words in chapter 757. They cry with a loud voice. Now, he was, Stephen himself was looking into the presence of God, saw Jesus on the throne. But they shout with a loud voice, they scream literally, up their ears, ran at him and him and took him outside to stone him. Different reaction in the presence of God. Not always the presence of God has positive effect on people, sometimes contrary. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Here's another question. Um, are there more acts of worship and services that can usher in God's presence besides living a holy life and obeying the Lord? You have in Acts 13, verse 1 and 2. You can gather together with believers to worship God. In any place that minister to God. Minister to God just to give Him worship and glory. God will always be present. Where two or three are gathered together in Jesus' name, that means the whole purpose is for Jesus, we can expect something. The same way we gather together every Friday, you can expect an encounter with God's presence, even when you're all alone joining together. And God is good. We're going to gather together uh, with uh, some Sabah believers and some who are uh, traveling there uh, on February the 5th and 6th. And about 16 of us gather together. And we'll be on altar on the 5th and we worship together for all night prayer. We expect something when we gather together and worship Him that whole night in prayer. So we're going to broadcast that so that you can receive the same anointing and impartation. Mm. Uh, Pastor, please. Uh, yes. On the book of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul is talking there about uh, these different types of body. He's talking about uh, the Sukikos body, the natural body, and the pneumaticos body in First Corinthians 15. Please, I would like to know what's the difference between these two bodies that he mentioned. In First Corinthians 15, uh, which passage you're looking at? You're talking it's about supposed to be like uh, where he's talking about the glories and how uh, a body when different it's animals, not, yeah. yeah, but downward, downward again. He's talking and about 40? different glories, celestial body, terrestrial bodies, well, uh, and then he's talking about the maticos, the natural bodies, and spiritual body. It's not spiritual body, it's actually talking about heavenly bodies and uh, earthly bodies. And then he said there's one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, one glory of stars. Each stars also differ from one another in glory. And so he's talking about the multifaceted glory of God. Actually, when it comes to God's glory, there's a different glory of the Father, the different glory of the Son, and there's a different glory of all the seven spirits of God. Each one holds a different glory. And then for humans, we all have the manifestation of glory in our life, but it's slightly adjusted to our nature and personality. We are all like jewels. When the light of God goes through us, the cutting and shape of the diamond makes each diamond unique. So that happens. All glory is from God. When the glory flows through a a uh, different vessel through an angel or through us. Uh, the glory is customized and, um, and adjusted to our DNA and it becomes different and unique. In other words, the glory becomes unique. Each star is different. Okay, Pastor, thank you. Uh, please, verse, Amen. verse 44. Verse 44. Verse 44. 
Yes. Quite it is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. A spiritual body is talking about resurrection body. It's both natural and spiritual. And so that's where it is. There's a natural body, there's a spiritual body. Yes, the spiritual body is life-giving. So our new body, resurrected, is both natural and supernatural, a spiritual body. Okay, thank you. Well, praise the Lord, that's an interesting question that you have asked. And uh, uh, Colin, any addition and comments? Yeah, Pastor, when you spoke about uh, each of one is, each one of us is like a different vessel or crystal, you know, where when the presence of God flow through or the glory of God flow through, um, it contains... Um, our DNA, our spiritual DNA. Mm. Um, so I think recently I was um, looking at a video about somebody who is an opera singer evaluating somebody else who is a, uh, say a young person just uh, started singing and was very doing very well. And the person was saying that, uh, wow, the, the experience that this person had, you know, which she has some like, a difficult experience and uh, everything you know is embodied in her her singing her her, her voice uh, so it, it leads me to think indeed as you have been teaching that um, uh, even whatever is flowing through us our words um, would contain um, the DNA of God that is in a way um, uh, customized to our uh, special spiritual DNA to deliver out. And so even as I was thinking about that, then I was understanding that if, when, when God speaks to us, even if he doesn't say, you know, like uh, a legible sentence, if he just say love, you know, it's just uh, any slight sound to us, because it contains his DNA, it expresses a lot more than just, you know, the uh, the words or the sentence and it mm. contains um, uh, something special for us to receive Amen that is indeed true mm -hmm. mm. but to bring the best out of us is a diamond being cut or crystal being cut you know all precious stones do not look nice in its raw form all precious stones have to be cut and the cutting is painful. The suffering is painful. And a good jewel cutter must also look at the angles that are already inside the piece of precious stone. So when he slices it, it follows an internal atomic arrangement. And then as he brings out what's already inside in atomic alignment, the jewel becomes shiny. Mm. When the light goes into it, it brings its own uniqueness. And although all the glory comes from Jesus as it spread into his physical body, which is us, it will come out in a specially customized, unique glory. Amen. Amen. So we are the living living stones that the Lord is uh, creating for uh, the new Jerusalem glory to inhibit. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's why the 12 apostles all are different foundational stone. And the 12 gates is the names of the 12 tribes. Mm. All unique, but yet still from the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, even as uh, just now, um, uh, during the question and answer, so um, I, I did wonder how, uh, like some 
as pastor, as you say, you know, we, we go through the different uh, molding and suffering and trials and all that is to cut us so that um, we would be formed in a certain way that, that will bring, all, bring out the best that the Lord has for us. So mm. even as uh, we see uh, the lives of the different mm. uh, men and women of God, some of them, uh, uh, like, mm, okay, if, for, for Jesus, uh, he was able to, um, people cannot touch him, you know, when the, it's not the time yet. And cannot harm him because the Lord has his protection. And the, of course, the Lord has protected uh, uh, Daniel and, you know, different people at different times. But the Lord also allowed, like, Stephen to be stoned, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. Paul also, you know, had his um, uh, suffering and in prison. So, uh, this morning as I was uh, uh, asleep, I had, I had a, a short dream and I saw that... Um, uh, I was actually trying to um, gather the enemy's uh, information after I have been <laughs> captured and uh, released two times. Uh, <laughs> so it In was very really funny. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, it's like no spy movie, you know, you, you're trying to, uh, because you've been captured, so you 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 know something about the enemy, you're trying to find out about them, but captured two times. And I said, oh, okay. Then I was start, then I reading, then as I read the book of Acts, I say, oh, okay, yeah, the people also, they got persecuted. Uh, Paul and Silas got jailed and then they got released. And uh, uh, But obviously, the, the Lord has his own purpose and some of us have to go through some kind of uh, cutting and suffering um, to uh, uh, bring out some something in us. Uh, but some of us, you know, the Lord gives us the privilege of uh, 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 defeating the enemy in front of uh, of us, uh, like Jesus, you know, um, uh, able to walk through the crowd and they can't touch him, not at the right time. Uh, but of course, the Lord allowed uh, allow himself to be also um, uh, crucified, you know, when, when uh, the time comes. So, yeah, I found this just uh, interesting. That's why I... I um, uh, shared about uh, uh, the message this morning. Um, but I also saw that uh, this um, uh, Moses, um, uh, there is a, a sense like for many, many of us also where, and Moses, when he was 40, he was not, he was not ready. He thinks he is ready, but he's not. Then the Lord waited another 40 years for him to be Ready, then he thinks he's not ready uh, at that time. Uh, so some of sometimes even through our um, trials, um, we are humble, and um, that is the Lord preparing us to be ready. But actually, after the humbling process, a lot of us feel more unready. <laughs> yes, oh. that's true. At forty. Moses had a lot of experience, but there was still pride. One of the things God tried to get rid of our lives is pride. It's the greatest hindrance to him. Uh, at the age of 80, he was really uh, down and down and felt downtrodden. He didn't even feel ready. And yet, that was when he was ready. And uh, the Lord uh, was, uh, Father God, he showed in the book of Acts about, you know, I think it's Stephen's preaching, uh, that it says that uh, uh, God is bringing forth a prophet uh, again like Moses. And uh, as in Moses' life, as an example, he was rejected. Actually, Moses was rejected first by the people. Mm. Yeah. So Jesus was also re re rejected by the by the people in his first coming. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah. Moses, you know, later on, he showed the, you know, like one of the greatest signs and wonders and brought forth the presence of God. So in this yeah. end time, it's also, um, you know, the the, uh, the Lord, he's bringing forth the perfect, his kingdom, his body, and it will show forth the greatest um, uh, sign and wonders and miracle. Amen. Amen. We are all going to see and experience that. That's our blessing. Hmm. There's a question there, Pastor. Please can you throw a little more light on Psalms 24, verse 3 and 4. 
And Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4 is this verse that says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face. Uh, it's very clear that uh, clean hands and a pure heart. Clean is katarizo, and, uh, and it's the same word for pure in the Greek. And purity and sincerity, yeah. holiness is important for the presence of God. He who is not holy will not see the Lord linked to Hebrews. So let's seek holiness, let's seek love, and let's love him with all our hearts, minds, and soul. Amen. Praise God. Let's give thanks to the Lord and have a blessed Sunday. And next Sunday, I'll be traveling to Barakalalang and uh, we still have our Sunday meeting. And uh, then we have a special uh, all night prayer from Barka Lalang in, uh, on the 5th and 6th. I've been asking the Lord, uh, you know, most of the time when we go to any place, there's a reason. And um, asking the Lord about uh, why is it you want us to be there? Apparently, at some point in the near future, we will have a 24 hour praise and worship established there. And uh, as, as one of the places God has chosen, it's also uh, been prepared for that since the beginning of revivals. And after the tsunami in 2029, uh, Sarawak will be the main part of uh, Malaysia. And uh, thank God that God has also blessed Malaysia. I said, why, uh, why is this country important to you? It's almost like nothing on the planet Earth. And uh, so it seems that God wants to bless the country uh, because it's the country of my birth. And uh, for some reason, it's a blessing that God wants to release there and it's chosen Sarawak. And it has been, and it will be an important um, center of praise and worship 24 hours in this end time revival. And we will also have 24-hour praise and worship, of course, in Australia and in all the Canada and all the various places where we plant 10,000 churches. So uh, we're coming to an interesting time. And you always see in some of the prophecies, time, appointed time and all this. And even in uh, some of the verses that Colin read earlier, you see to the ending time. And it's like God has a special time and special event. We are entering into an interesting time uh, this year in 2024. Let's uh, give ourselves to the rest of this 24-hour um, prayer and this all-night prayer and also the 40-day fast. We praise God and we bless each one of you and pray God's special blessings be upon your life as you release His breakthroughs and His restoration this year into all our lives. Amen. Praise the Lord.